Good evening, I'm Mike Knetter, and welcome to the UW Now live stream series where we bring you experts from the UW community speaking about various aspects of the COVID-19 crisis. Tonight marks two weeks since the presidential election, which featured the highest voter turnout in a century. And indeed, votes are still being counted today. And there's still a healthy range of opinion about the results of that vote, which was conducted under the unusual backdrop of a pandemic. We have three nationally known experts from our highly regarded political science department to help us sift and winnow the outcomes. Barry Burden is an expert on electoral politics and directs the Elections Research Center. David Cannon is a scholar on election law and is the chair of the Department of Political Science. And Ken Mayer is an expert on the American presidency, campaign finance, and election administration. Gentlemen, thank you for making time for us tonight. A very timely show. And I know you've all been talking kind of nonstop probably the last two months leading up to the election and, and in the wake of it. So uh, appreciate you being able to share your time with us tonight. Kicking things off will be Barry Burden, the Lions Family Chair in Electoral Politics and Director of the Elections Research Center. Professor Burden is affiliated with the Follett School of Public Affairs, the Tommy G. Thompson Center on Public Leadership, and the Election Administration Project. His research and teaching emphasize the electoral politics and representation in the U.S. He's co-editor of The Measure of American Elections, author of Personal Roots of Representation, and co-author of Why Americans Split Their Tickets, Campaigns, Competition, and Divided Government. He's won numerous awards for his articles and for his teaching. Barry received his PhD from Ohio State University. And I must say, not many Buckeyes make it to this show, Barry, but we are delighted to have you with us tonight and really look forward to hearing your insights about the election. Thanks, Mike. Uh, this is one benefit of doing this event virtually is I don't hear the boos from the crowd when you mention Ohio State. <laughs> Uh, I do remind people that Bucky and Buckeye sound a lot alike, so I think it's fine. Uh, so I'm going to provide a kind of overview of the election, highlighting what you might be surprised to see are pretty unremarkable aspects of the election. There were clearly historical elements here. This was the first U.S. presidential election held during a pandemic. There was a massive shift to voting by mail and voting early and an impeached president was on the ballot running for re-election for the first time. So those are clearly historical events that uh, maybe won't be repeated. But I wanna emphasize what I think are more mundane parts of the election that make it, I think, a little less exceptional than you might expect. So let me start with one way in which the election was remarkable. And that's the next slide. It was remarkable in that a one-term president was booted from office. What you see here are the outcomes of elections since 1960, so going back 60 years, for cases where a party was in the White House for only one term, those are the cases on the left, versus situations where the White House was held by the party for two terms or more. And what you can see is that presidents or their parties seldom lose when they've been in the administration for only four years. It's only happened once since 1960, and that was Jimmy Carter being defeated for re-election in 1980. So uh, credit to the Democrats in knocking off a president, which is hard to do. Uh, notice on the right, you get just the opposite pattern. When a party has been in power for eight years or longer, they're very likely to be defeated. There's only one exception to that since 1960. Uh, and I think it says something about Trump's reelection odds or the prospect that he would continue for a second term, given that his victory in 2016 was after two terms of the Obama administration. The Democrats were set up to lose in that instance, the way parties often are. After eight years of time in office, I, the electorate is often feeling a kind of fatigue and looking for a different direction. And they went a different direction with Trump in 2016, but decided not to keep him in 2020. So this is one of the few really exceptional elements this year in the outcome. But what I'm going to show you now are the ways in which it was not so unusual. Let's start with the Electoral College. As you've probably seen, all of the states have now been projected or called by all the major media outlets. The result is 306 electoral votes for Biden, 232 for Trump. That's almost a perfect mirror image of four years ago uh, when Trump won 306 electoral votes. 
the one difference is that four years ago, there were some so-called faithless electors who didn't vote for their party's nominee. But essentially, this is the division. It was not exceptional four years ago, and it's not this time around. Uh, five states did flip from Trump to the Democrats. Three of those are in the Midwest, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, which are often thought of as the blue wall. It's a very tenuous blue wall. Uh, Biden won those states, but not by big margins. Uh, he also converted Georgia and Arizona, which Democrats had not won since 1996 and hadn't won, I think, since the 1950s before that. So those five states made the difference. Everything else held exactly where it was. So very much a stasis uh, kind of result. Um, I would mention also that Biden's victory was not the kind of future Democratic Party that people like Stacey Abrams uh, from Georgia have been imagining. His victory was not the result of a massive increase in turnout among African-American and Hispanic voters, for example. Turnout in those minority groups appears to be pretty flat or maybe down. And more Black and Hispanic voters actually voted for Trump this time around than four years ago. So Biden's victory is one that's built really on winning over a slightly larger share of white voters, especially those with college educations and many of the suburban voters you've heard about. So a pretty different kind of coalition, I think, than the Democrats were imagining. So that's the electoral college pattern, not terribly exceptional. And that's also the case if we look at the popular vote. As Mike said, votes are still being tabulated in places like New York and California, and that will push the Biden numbers higher. But I think most projections are that when all is said and done, Biden will have won the popular vote by four and a half or five percentage points. Let's call it five and be generous. There it is. That's the light bar out on the right-hand side of that graph. And what you see is going back to World War II, all of the other margins of victory in the popular vote, blue bars being cases where the Democrats won, Republicans uh, in red. And the, a five-point victory this year is nothing to write home about. You, you'd rather be on the winning side than the losing side, but it's, it's no landslide. It's right in line with where things have been in recent years. Uh, in fact, the, the Democrats winning the popular vote is also in line with where things have been in recent years. Democrats have won seven of the last eight presidential elections when it comes to the popular vote, which just not always translated to an electoral college vote win for them as in 2000 and 2016. Now, to give Biden a little credit here, uh, you'll notice that elections in these recent decades don't tend to be won by large margins. There has not been a result with a candidate winning by more than nine points since Reagan's landslide back in 84, which you'll see is uh, one of the long bars pointing down there. So we are in a kind of era in which the margins between the parties are small and they're nearly equally balanced. So maybe we should not be expecting double digit victories, but this one is, is pretty far away from that. It's a fine, solid result for the Democrats. It's, it's no landslide. And as I think David Cannon's gonna tell you later this evening, it did not translate into success down the ballot. This is really limited to uh, Trump's defeat and hasn't gone much beyond that. So that's the election result. Now, how about voter participation? Mike mentioned that turnout was exceptionally high this year, the highest in a century. That is correct. About two thirds of eligible voters, 66% and change, voted in this presidential election. Uh, that does not seem exceptional to our friends who live in other democracies around the world, but for the US, that's a remarkably high mark. You can see it here. Uh, it's the highest in all of our lifetimes and the highest since women were won the right to vote uh, back in 1920. So there really is there's no comparable election to it in any recent decade. It is, however, a, the continuation of a trend that has been happening since the 1990s. If you follow the graph, out on the right-hand side of the screen, turnout has sort of been steadily increasing from the mid-90s until now. 2020 maybe accelerated that, but it doesn't look to be necessarily a response to the pandemic. Uh, in fact, in the 2018 midterm election, just two years ago, turnout also set a record. It was the highest in a midterm election in the century. So I think more of what's happening here is a response to the polarization of the parties that tends to bring out voters and make campaigns more intense and feel more serious to voters. But also it's something about the Trump era, both the 2018 and 2020 elections, the two federal elections during his time in office have set new records for participation. Um, so that's where we are. And I, I think it'd be a mistake to attribute it only to voting by mail or the pandemic or something else.
The other thing to note is that turn up was, turnout was up in every single state from four years ago, by large margins in some cases, five or 10 points. Each of these dots represents one of the states showing its turnout in 2016 along the bottom and its turnout this year along the side. Every point is above the 45 degree line. And you can see that the swing states, which I've tried to mark there, places like Georgia, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, tend to be on the upper edge of that seeing increases of five or 10, or in some cases, 12 percentage points. You don't get turnout increases like that if both parties aren't fully engaged. This was not a case of a blue wave of Democratic voters who showed up and won the election for Joe Biden. Biden had a fine victory, but as I said, it did not really trickle on down the ballot. And uh, Trump's fairly strong showing, one that beat the polls, was a result of Republicans also showing up. So it's really high levels of engagement on both sides. Uh, over 20 states had turnout above 70% this year. That's really unprecedented. In a typical presidential ele election year, maybe two or three states would hit that mark. Almost half of them did it this year, and there are several states there pushing the 80% mark. These are numbers you just don't see in the United States. We're gonna have to see whether they continue once um, Trump has gone from the scene. One last thing about turnout, I just want to note what a successful election this was. In the midst of a pandemic, uh, with all the difficulties that election officials had in the early primaries and summer elections that took place at the beginning of the pandemic, all of the lawsuits that were all ongoing, the scrutiny that election officials have been under, the criticism that they have faced, uh, the massive shift to voting by mail. We've never seen a revolution like this in voting in a six-month period. The election came off really wonderfully with really only small glitches and the kind of small regular problems you'd expect here and there, um, but overall a real tribute to our election officials all around the country. So if you, if you know one of those folks, be sure to thank them in the coming days. So that's my opening bet. Thanks very much. And uh, back to Mike. Well, you gave us a lot to think about there, lots to chew on, some great data. Thank you, Barry, for, uh, for being here. I'm sure we'll have some questions on that. Next up, we have David Cannon. Chairman of the Political Science Department and Professor of American Politics. He's also the editor of Election Law Journal and is affiliated with the Elections Research Center. His teaching and research interests are in American political institutions with a focus on Congress, race and politics, the presidency, and political parties. He was a recipient of the UW Madison Distinguished Teaching Award and is author of numerous books and articles, including Race Redistricting and Representation the 1999 winner of Best Book on Legislative Politics, The Dysfunctional Congress, The Individual Roots of Institutional Dilemma with Ken Mayer, and Actors, Athletes, and Astronauts, Political Amateurs in the U.S. Congress. David received his PhD from the University of Minnesota. David, thanks for being here. Good to be with you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll be talking today about uh, the transition to from President Trump to Joe Biden, and then I'll look at the Senate and House results as well. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, and then yeah, the next slide. So the with the peaceful transition, uh, as Barry just mentioned, it really was a, an amazingly smooth election given the circumstances. But now with the uh, continued resistance of President Trump to accepting the result of the election. Uh, we are seeing a little more unrest in the streets now, and I, I think you know, people are you know, concerned about what's going to happen in the next two months. Will we have a peaceful transition? So that's going to be the uh, first thing I want to focus on. I'll also talk a little bit about the Senate and how it looks like the Republicans probably will hang on to the Senate. Um, here, it depends on the two uh, Georgia elections, uh, the runoff elections in January, on January 6th. Uh, so far, there's been a net gain of one seat for the Democrats. Uh, they were expected to actually gain control of the Senate. They were expected to pick up about three to four was the sort of median forecast there. Uh, and that didn't turn out. And so, as, as Barry mentioned, uh, Biden's success at the top of the ticket did not uh, translate on down for the ticket to the Senate and House races. And the House actually was even a bigger surprise than the Senate. Uh, the Senate Democrats were given about a 75% chance of picking up the Senate, uh, but they were given a 97% chance of hanging on to majority control of the House, which right now they're ripping on just by their fingernails. They just are sitting at 218, which is the bare minimum you need uh, 
they'll probably end up at about 222. There's still like 13 races that haven't been called yet. And we'll look at those in a little more detail in a few minutes, but it looks like the Republicans will pick up somewhere between 10 and 12 seats uh, in the House. So next slide. So the, the thing I want to talk about next is the, uh, the question of, you know, can President Trump stay in office? That he is not conceding defeat at this point. He's not uh, recognizing that, that Joe Biden has, has won the election. So what, what is the basis for him trying to, to pull this off? Well, the first uh, is going to the courts. And he has attempted uh, various lawsuits in most of the swing states. And generally, they've been in three categories, claims of fraud, uh, claims that there wasn't uh, enough access for election observers, and then uh, equal protection kind of claims under the 14th Amendment. In each one of these types of cases, uh, they've either been dismissed or withdrawn, with a few exceptions of some cases that are still in court. But in all of those cases, there aren't enough votes that are still in doubt even if they were to win those, uh, those cases, to actually change the results in any of the states. And so one of the, the top election law experts in the country, Rick Kazan, said the other day on his election law blog that there is like 0% chance that Trump will be able to, to win the presidency through the, the federal courts at this point. And in the cases that have been dismissed, uh, the, the, the arguments presented by the, the lawyers for the president uh, have had such flimsy arguments that you know, in one case in, in Michigan, the, the Judge Stevens uh, dismissed a filing as inadmissible hearsay within hearsay. It was like double hearsay. Uh, and then in the uh, Pennsylvania case, it was dismissed. There, uh, the, the Trump attorney admitted under oath that actually was a non-zero number of election observers there. And the federal judge then said, well, I'm sorry, then what's your problem? And dismissed the case. Um, in the cases in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, they were trying to throw out much larger number of, of votes uh, based on the argument that mail-in votes were being treated differently than in-person votes and didn't use the same standards for qualifying to, to vote. Those were actually withdrawn by the Trump's attorney before they were heard because I think they realized that the argument was not going to fly. Um, recounts of the, the second strategy, and here too, there really is no way that this is going to change the results of the election. Here in Wisconsin, we just had our canvassing process completed this morning. Uh, there was a net shift of 73 votes towards Joe Biden after they checked all the numbers. Uh, recount uh, yields similarly small shifts anytime there's a, a national recount. In fact, over the last 20 years, if you look at all of the statewide recounts that have happened in 20 years, the average vote shift is about 400 votes. Uh, and you're looking at more than 45,000 votes that need to be flipped in uh, Georgia, Wisconsin, Arizona, which would get Trump to the uh, tie actually at 269, 269, in which case he would actually win the presidency uh, because the House of Representatives then would decide the, the, uh, who would be president. And there's a majority of states uh, that are aligned with the Republicans right now. So that would be enough electoral votes to do it. But in order to get that outcome, you'd have to flip more than 45,000 votes in a recount, and that simply isn't going to happen. In fact, Scott Walker had a tweet in the next slide uh, shortly after the election where Scott Walker uh, tweeted that after the recount uh, that we had in the Wisconsin Supreme Court race in 2011, there was a swing of 300 votes. And he points out that in the recount that uh, Jill Stein, the Green Party, candidate asked for in 2016, Donald Trump gained 131 votes. And uh, Scott Walker points out that 20,000 is a high hurdle. Uh, and if, you know, that's uh, based on historical precedent, it's not likely that that would be overturned. Um, and then the next slide then takes the, uh, the final approach of what President Trump might use as a strategy for staying in office. And this too is not going to work. And this is something that you may have been reading about of the idea of alternative slates of electors. And so what would happen here in states controlled by uh, the Republican state legislatures like in Arizona, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Nevada, Wisconsin, it could happen as well, um, is where you would overturn the popular vote by claiming it was a failed election. And then uh, if they you know, fail to certify the vote and, uh, and there's not uh, a certified slate of popular vote uh, determined electors, then the Republican legislature could potentially present an alternative slate for Donald Trump. 
Well, this is not going to work for three reasons. First, there already have been in a couple of the key states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, the Republican legislative leadership has rejected this idea. Uh, the Speaker of the House in Michigan said that whoever gets the most votes will win Michigan, period, end of story, we move on. Uh, similar comments from the Pennsylvania leaders. Uh, second is that there are Democratic governors in three of those states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. And if they're following state law, this actually would require the governor's signature because it's a state law that determines that the popular vote determines the outcome of the elector, electoral college votes. And to change that process, uh, you'd have to have a presidential signature or a gubernatorial signature to, to do that. But clearly, that's that's not going to fly. Uh, and in fact, to do that after the election also would would not uh, would not be upheld by the courts. And finally, even if all of that went ahead anyway, and they presented their slates, uh, and you had two alternative slates, then one presented by the governor, one by the state legislature, then Congress would actually decide which slate to accept under the Electoral Count Act of 1887. And here, you'd have to believe that the four Republican senators who've actually already called Joe Biden to congratulate him, uh, Murkowski, Collins, Romney, and Sass, uh, would vote with the 48 Democrats, and that would be enough to then reject these alternative slates. And so uh, by those, you know, this really does seem like it would be a stretch to have that be a, an alternative path for President Trump to stay in office. Okay, then quickly just to, to look at the results in the, the Senate and the House. So the Senate map looks like this uh, with most of the country uh, not changing uh, parties for their Senate races. Uh, the darker colored ones are the states that flipped. So of all of the, the races that were up this year in the Senate, only three have flipped so far, Arizona and Colorado to the Democrats, uh, Alabama to the Republicans with a net gain of one for the Democrats. Mentioned those two Georgia races on January 6th that could potentially determine the control of the Senate if the Democrats pick up both of them, uh, giving a 50-50 tie with Vice President Harris, breaking that tie would give Democrats majority control. Uh, that's, I think, a bit of a long shot right now, given the Republican Party's track record in Georgia and, and winning runoff elections. They usually do pretty well in those. Um, but the state is definitely trending in the blue direction. So uh, there'll be very competitive races and we'll you know, see how those uh, turn out. The House also was generally a kind of a status quo election. There, the uh, incumbent re-election rate was around 96%. Uh, and so that's about as status quo as you can get. And again, the, the dark shaded uh, districts are the ones that, that flipped control. Uh, the Democrats flipped a couple seats. The Republicans so far have, have flipped uh, 11. Um, and so there's a, a net gain so far of, of eight uh, for the Republicans. And so again, I'm guessing that'll end up about uh, 10 to 12 once all the dust is settled. Uh, and finally, just one last thing I want to mention. This is something actually has come up in uh, my, my Congress class I'm teaching this semester. One of the students asked about this uh, and said that, you know, they've been reading about how a lot of their friends are saying that the reason that the Democrats didn't do better in the House and why the Republicans actually are picking up seats is the Democrats didn't uh, run far enough to the left. Um, but the, the opposite, I think, is actually closer to what actually happened. And the, there was a, uh, a sort of internal discussion about this in the Democratic caucus last week where House moderates blamed the losses on the socialist label that was pinned on them uh, and that they were, you know, even if they were quite moderate themselves, they end up losing because of that, that label. And the progressives came back and said, well, no, it's just you didn't run far enough to the left. But the evidence does seem to to back up the former claim rather than the latter, that these were districts that were very uh, right center districts, that most of them had been districts, the Democrats has flipped from Republican Party to the Democratic Party in 2018 and now flipped back to the Republican Party. In a couple of cases, they were uh, very moderate districts like the Minnesota 7th that had been held by a moderate Democrat for many years, but finally flipped Republican. So it does seem like uh, this idea that the, the party would have done better had they run harder left just doesn't stand up to scrutiny when you look at the, the House races for the ones that the Democrats actually won in. Okay, so that's uh, my spiel, and uh, Ken will take it from here. Well, thank you, David.
Um, next up, we've got Ken Mayer, who is a professor of American politics and affiliated with the La Follette School of Public Affairs. Ken's teaching and research interests are in American government and institutions, especially Congress and the presidency, campaign finance, and election administration. His current research focuses on evaluating the effectiveness of recent state level campaign finance reforms and election administration. He's active as an expert witness in campaign finance, redistricting, and voter ID litigation. He has also consulted on recount disputes and Voting Rights Act matters. He's won numerous awards for his teaching and research. And I might add one of those awards is a UW 2020 grant to do further study on redistricting. He's also the author of, with the stroke of a pen, Executive Orders and Presidential Power, The Political Economy of Defense Contracting, The Dysfunctional Congress, The Individual Roots of an Institutional Dilemma, with our previous speaker, David Cannon, and Presidential Leadership, Politics and Policymaking. Ken received his PhD from Yale University. Ken, welcome. Thanks, Mike. It's good to be with you. And I'm sorry we can't be together in person. Uh, but uh, what I'm going to talk about is taking things down to <clears throat> a level uh, below the federal elections to talk about uh, the effect of the 2020 elections on redistricting. But before uh, we get to that, I just want to make one uh, observation as a quick take, if we can move to the next slide. And agreeing with uh, what David said about the prospects for any uh, litigation or recounts to uh, change the, uh, the election results, I'd put it somewhat more emphatically that, that the claims of uh, material levels of uh, illegal voting or fraud, uh, I'd describe them as laughable, except for the part about how harmful they are to uh, democratic legitimacy. Every single claim of irregularities has fallen apart uh, when subjected to even the mildest scrutiny. Of all the cases that the, the president's campaign has filed or the president's supporters have filed on his behalf, the only, they've all, either all been dismissed, withdrawn, and the only case that uh, the president got the result he was looking for was when a federal judge in Pennsylvania ordered county election officials to segregate ballots that uh, were postmarked by election day that arrived after election day, uh, which election officials were doing in any case. And the claims that are left, as David had said, involve a very small number of ballots, 80 ballots here, 140 ballots there. So the, the prospect of uh, litigation or recounts changing uh, the results is essentially zero. We can move to the next slide. But when in thinking about the consequences of the election, one of the, the, the long-term effects of this is that the redistricting that takes place uh, after the 2020 census, which will happen, uh, will require every state with, uh, to redraw its state legislative districts and every state that has more than a single congressional district to redraw its congressional districts. And uh, as both Barry and David had indicated that below the presidential level, it was essentially a status quo there. And this is also true at the state level that there was only a single state, New Hampshire, where partisan control of either legislative chamber changed. And in New Hampshire, the Democrats had control of both going into 2020. And as the result of the election, the Republicans recaptured both. Uh, so this means that there will be basically no change in the partisanship of the states that control the redistricting process. One substantive change that in Colorado and Ohio voters I have lost Ken. 
um, Ken was talking about the substantive change in control in New Hampshire. Um, maybe we can, uh, I don't know if David would like to finish that up or maybe Ken can come back in, but uh, why don't we move to some questions and then we'll try to move back to the end of Ken's presentation. Uh, and if he's able to come back and do it, great. Otherwise, um, we'll pass the baton to David since they were co-authors once. Why not? Huh? Sure. So, yeah, I, could, I could do that if I had to. I definitely all right. Could pinch it. <laughs> so. All right. So um, if, if Barry and David uh, could come back in, um, you know, I'm going to start out, David, uh, both you and Ken had addressed issues about fraud in this election. And I, I guess, uh, you know, if you haven't worked an election and you haven't really studied these things, and you just watch the news, it is a little bit unsettling, um, you know, sometimes to hear all these claims. Now, I, I do hear the, the words repeated often, you know, there's no evidence of widespread fraud, which doesn't necessarily make me feel great, I'll admit. Um, Ken, are you back? I'm back. I'm sorry. We had uh, uh, we had problems with the internet uh, connection, which has become a routine part of all of our lives now. Um, but I, I think rather than uh, take up more time. Uh, I'd, I'd like to move to just to the last slide, if I if I sure could. that'd be great. We'll go back to that. Uh, one of the consequences of the Supreme Court deciding in 2019 that issues of partisan gerrymandering are no longer justiciable by the courts. What this means that it means that in, in states where state legislatures draw district lines but they essentially have free reign to draw lines that are as biased as they can, uh, as long as they comply with uh, other federal requirements such as equal population and the Voting Rights Act. And uh, one of the slides I have, I'm not gonna show it, sort of demonstrates that in 2010, how effective in Wisconsin, the Republican legislature was in drawing uh, a very effective and durable partisan gerrymandering mandering plan for the state legislature that allowed the Republican Party to maintain almost super majorities in the assembly. The, the number of seats that the Republicans controlled ranged between 59 and 63 seats uh, out of 99, even though in, in three elections they actually received Below, less than 50% of the uh, statewide vote. And the most that they received in 2014 was about uh, 52%. And this graph shows um, the, the, the differentials in the way that Democratic votes were translated into seats. Uh, the x-axis shows the statewide percentage of the vote that the parties received. And the y-axis shows the percentage or the number of seats, which is essentially the same as the percentage since there are 99. Uh, and what this shows since the red line is uh, well above the blue line for any plausible uh, range of uh, statewide votes that the, this gerrymandering plan was both very efficient in translating uh, votes into more seats uh, than would have been expected under a fair plan, but that both the 2018 and 2020 were right in the wheelhouse. So I'll stop here. I apologize for the uh, for the connectivity problems, and we can get back to when I came back in, Mike. You were asking a question about vote fraud. Yeah. So um, I, I was going to say, you know, uh, as as just an ordinary citizen, uh, you know, I watch the news. I, I don't work at the polls. Um, you know, if if there weren't the lawsuits, so I guess in this case, we've had a lot of court challenges in different states uh, that, as you've noted, have been thrown out. How do we know that our voting system is working well, absent those kind of challenges being thrown out? Do we do audits? You know, corporations are subject to audits on their financial statements. Um, are there any historical examples where we've uncovered fraudulent activity? And then, you know, in this case, we had the pandemic, so we had a lot more vote by mail versus voting in person. And does that raise any special security issues? I was just wondering if if you could address some of those questions. Sure, I'll, I'll take a, a, a crack at this. That, that it is true that voting by mail uh, raises different kinds of issues than when you physically go to the polls and, and cast a ballot where everything is under the control of uh, election officials. 
But that doesn't mean that voting by mail is not secure. There are uh, quite a number of checks that are in place that only someone who's a registered voter can receive a, a, a ballot. And uh, in, in Wisconsin, uh, when you, the first time you request a, an absentee ballot by mail, uh, you have to provide a copy of your photo ID. Many states have signature matching requirements. In Wisconsin, there's a witness requirement where you have to sign and the ballot has to be signed by someone else who is also uh, over the age of uh, 18. The, so the, and these ballots are very carefully tracked. So the, the notion that, as the president had suggested, that it's, it's possible to flood the zone with uh, uh, fraudulent ballots that, that aren't connected to a voter or that it's possible for uh, ballots to be submitted uh, on behalf of voters who have died or voters who uh, are not eligible. Uh, the, they, in practice, they, they're simply false. Uh, and one of the reasons that vote fraud is so rare is that it is both a crime that makes very little sense to commit because the idea that you're going to affect uh, an election result uh, with one or two fraudulent votes and anything larger than that would require a massive conspiracy that becomes more likely to detect. Uh, so the, the benefits of casting an illegal vote are essentially nil. The penalties are enormous. In Wisconsin, it's a, a class I felony that can net you three and a half years in prison and a $10,000 fine. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we know from experience and, and or I won't say experience, the, the empirics that uh, invariably claims of voter fraud or uh, uh, voters casting illegal ballots or election officials being able to manipulate vote totals and not get caught. Uh, it just doesn't happen. And I might just add to that, Mike, the cases that you sometimes hear about in the press, often allegations or suspicions, but upon further probing, they are usually misunderstandings or administrative errors. I'll give you an example from Wisconsin back in, I think this was the 2004 presidential election. There was a case of two people who were ex-felons, but were still on parole voting in Milwaukee. They did vote but they went into the polling place with their parole officer. They weren't sure if they were eligible to vote. They asked the poll worker, are we allowed to do this? And the poll worker said, yes, you are, which was not true. It was a misunderstanding. Uh, they registered on the spot because the state has same day voter registration. Both of them cast ballots. The parole officer also didn't know what was going on and allowed it to happen. So they committed a crime accidentally, but in an open view, not in an intentional way. You, you ask what protections are in place in, in Wisconsin, after every election, there's a full canvas of the state. Every county does a canvas of its own votes to make sure that they are accurate and complete. It's a bipartisan process. So there's a Democrat and a Republican, as David said, just finished this morning, open to the public. It was, the one in Dane County was live streamed. I watched some of it. It's like watching paint dry, but it's necessary. Uh, and so anyone who's serious about having these kinds of concerns can watch that process. And then coming up, there'll be an audit of the state where a random 5% of polling places around the state are selected. Those ballots are counted by hand and matched against the, the canvas results to make sure they're right. So there are a lot of procedures that I think most of the public doesn't know about. And maybe learning about those would help build up levels of confidence. And then finally, just to one last thing to add to this, to even give a, a greater sense of confidence in our election machinery, is that the recounts we do have Again, we've had you know, multiple statewide recounts over the years. They always show a very, very tiny proportion of votes being changed. And this is going through like vote by vote and making sure that it actually was correctly recorded. And there are you know, a few hundred out of you know, five, six, seven million votes that change when you do have a recount. And so I think the voters should have great confidence in the validity and integrity of our election system. Yeah, so I'll just follow up with, with two examples that there was a noteworthy allegation that a, a dead man had voted in Georgia, that he had died in 2006 and had continued to cast ballots. And reporters went to the address and they knocked on the door and his wife answered, who was registered as Mrs. 
uh, the man's name. And so she had been voting under that name and was very much alive. Uh, and on recounts, that there have been three elections, statewide elections since 2000, where the recount has actually flipped the result. Uh, this is the 2004 Washington gubernatorial race, the 2008 Minnesota Senate race, and I think a 2006 state auditor race in Vermont. The largest vote margin that has resulted in a recount flipping it is about 260 votes. And so what this tells us is that those counts are actually are accurate. Yeah, probably recount has as much chance being wrong. Who knows? <laughs> um, so uh, Barry, I'm gonna come to you with a question. The chancellor couldn't be with us tonight, but she had a question she wanted you to answer, which is um, how did the pandemic affect the outcome of this election? Did it seem to sway undecided voters or did things look different a year before the election than they looked on election day? Yeah, it's a good question. And I, I think the end result was different than what I was expecting. I believed, like a lot of people, that the pandemic probably worked to Biden's advantage because it pointed to an area where the public didn't have a positive rating of Trump's performance. He, Trump fared better when people were asked about his handling of the economy, say, where often more people said they approved than disapprove. But on the pandemic, Trump was underwater. And I figured as long as the public was focused on that, that um, he would be off his game and not be able to drive the messaging. Um, but it appears that it actually didn't have much effect. I had my students this semester produce predictions of the election outcome, forecasts, using regression models that political scientists have developed to forecast elections. Those models don't include anything about pandemics. They are based on things like economic performance under the incumbent, approval ratings of the incumbent, and uh, my students' predictions were right on. They predicted about 46 or 47 percent of the popular vote for Trump. The rest of Biden, that's about where it's going to end up, as I mentioned, about a four or five point gap. So the pandemic didn't play much role there other than it did push the economy in a negative direction. And that again, that was one area where even despite what had happened to GDP from the first quarter to the second and third, the public still had a mildly positive view of Trump. And so he didn't pay much price for that as well. There were also some Trump supporters who proudly went to vote in person as a show of solidarity, I think, with the president and standing up against the pandemic, wanting to show their resolve. So in the end, it may have been cl close to a wash in a lot of states. Mm -hmm. Great observation. Um, audience question from Michael Betlock. How does the voting pattern look when you slice it by rural versus urban and suburban? So actually, we've got a good slide on that. If you go to slide uh, 29, we can show that in Wisconsin. This comes from a analysis, county level analysis that was, uh, I believe this is uh, Washington Post had this, where they show every county in the state with the size of the arrow, the big blue arrows are bigger percent change going Democratic direction, the bigger red arrows in the Republican direction. And what you can see happening in Wisconsin happened uh, pretty much all over the country. There are some exceptions like Colorado, uh, Arizona, there were a few exceptions to this, but in general, what you saw happening is that the rural counties that had gone for Donald Trump in 2016, even went more for Donald Trump in 2020. There were like 33 of our 72 counties that fell into that category, rural counties that moved even more in the Republican direction. The urban counties, you can see Dane County, Milwaukee, Superior, uh, La Crosse and Eau Claire, to some extent, not quite as big. Um, Menominee County is the big uh, blue arrow up there, too. It's a small uh, county, but it, it's a, a large Native American population. Um, those were So that's the one rural county that shifted blue. But in general, it's the urban areas that were moving uh, more in the, uh, the Democratic direction, but actually more suburban than urban. Um, so the you know, urban areas had the highest percent Democratic vote, but it's actually the suburban areas um, that were trending more in the Democratic direction. Uh, and you saw that happening, again, all over the country, as that's where Biden did his best, was in those uh, suburban uh, counties where he had the biggest shift, whereas Trump held his own or increased his margin in the rural areas. So that's this kind of regional polarization that our colleague Kathy Kramer has written so much about um, that was really evident in 2016, was even probably a stronger relationship in 2020. Thank you.
Uh, another audience question from Max uh, for Barry. Um, thoughts on why polling has failed us in 2016 and 2020, and can, you know, can we ever trust it again? Thoughts Barry, we've got your uh, slide 24. There has your slide on that. Actually, want to go to that? Yeah, we can show that if you like. Uh, just to ground the question here. Uh, here are the final polling results in six states, six key swing states. These are the averages of many polls done by Real Clear Politics. And then if you just advance the, just hit the space bar to move ahead, you're going to see the actual results pop up, I think. Yeah, hit next slide and it'll come up. In red. There we go. So Biden's on the left, Trump's on the right. The red is the real results, at least as of a couple of days ago. What's remarkable is that the polling got Biden about right in every state. It's within about a percentage point, sometimes less than that, definitely within the margin of error and right on the money in places like Wisconsin and Michigan. It's the Trump vote that's being underestimated in every state, sometimes by a, a point or two, which is fine, uh, but sometimes by four or five points, which is not fine. And that's where the failings are. And Wisconsin, again, is one of the worst states in terms of the mismatch between the polling and the outcome, it tends to be states with higher numbers of non-college educated white voters where this pattern is happening. Some of it is clearly that we are not interviewing a sufficient number of Trump voters, but it's not simply a matter of education because ne nearly all of the good pollsters now make sure that their samples represent the electorate accurately in terms of college and non-college -edu non educated white voters, that fix is not enough. But there are apparently some, not just Trump voters, but Republican voters down the ticket this year who were, set, who were not included in the survey in the first place. So it's not exactly a Trump phenomenon. Uh, it's not a shy Trump voter phenomenon. We're pretty sure that's not happening. It's not that people are in the survey and then are not willing to admit they're voting for Trump. That doesn't explain why someone like Susan Collins in Maine would outperform the polls by a mile. She's a moderate Republican. Uh, she beat the polls. There's, there's no shy Susan Collins voter, I don't think, in Maine. So that's one side of things. I think under including, for mysterious reasons, Trump voters, especially in states with larger white non-college populations. But also, I think the Biden numbers are a sign of worry as well. The polls should not be hitting those numbers exactly. The polls always have some residue of undecided voters. After all, they're conducted before the campaign is over. So some people should still be undecided. And in most years, the numbers for both candidates are below what you eventually see, right? As the final voters make up their minds. Here, we're hitting Trump about on, or maybe even slightly overestimating his vote. This might be a problem on the side of the Democrats being overly enthusiastic about taking our surveys and sort of cranking up the numbers here. This is part of the activism on that end of the ideological scale. This is gonna consume me and a lot of people who do polling over the next couple of years. Um, I will point out that the polls were pretty good in the 2018 midterm elections. They got it about right around the country and very good in the Democratic primaries this spring. So in spring and summer. So there's something about 2016 and 2020 and maybe the nature of the Trump coalition that is a real challenge. Interesting. Uh, question from Lou Holland um, for Ken or for all of you, uh, has the electoral college system run its course and should it be retired? So I'll, I'll take the first crack at that and then turn it over to my colleagues that in, in one sense, this is a purely hypothetical argument because there is no chance at all that a constitutional amendment will make its way through the process, the two thirds majorities in both the House and the Senate and then three quarters of the states. It's just not gonna happen. At the same time, you can also say that the, well, I, I can, uh, I will advance as a proposition that the idea that the framers created the electoral college as this carefully calibrated mechanism that balanced competing interests and uh, was designed to produce this uh, result that, that balanced state interests and assured that uh, presidents would have majority support is simply false, that the Electoral College was a kludge. It was a compromise that failed almost immediately by the election of 1800. There was some concern that it might lead to the breakup of the union. 
Uh, most of the justifications for the Electoral College, when you really subject them to scrutiny, they, they fall apart. Having said that, it's, it's here. And other than the slight likelihood that there's been an effort in states over the last decade for states to amend their laws to allocate their electors uh, to the candidate that receives the most votes nationwide, it's called the National Popular Vote Compact. There's some question about whether it's, uh, whether it's actually legal or constitutional, but it hasn't actually reached the, the trigger point where it goes into effect. So uh, about the only way I think that the Electoral College, that, that both parties will see it as in, in their interest to change it is that if it leads to an equal opportunity for each party to wind up on the wrong side of that. And right now, it uniformly benefits the Democrats and, or I'm sorry, the Republicans. And so uh, there's there's no incentive for Republicans to consider uh, getting rid of it. You know, there might be an opening when Texas finally becomes competitive. I, I think Ted Cruz said something to that effect. He was worried about that day coming. Uh, I don't think it's going to be an amendment to the Constitution, as Ken said, but states are not obligated to do winner take all to decide their electoral votes. They could decide to allocate them proportionally. And if Republicans in a state like Texas start to see their large number of electoral votes going to Democrats more reliably, they might decide to do something proportional. That would start to look like a national popular vote, even with the Electoral College in place. Hmm. I, I do think it's really run its course. Um, you know, the as Ken said, some of the early justifications for it don't really hold up under scrutiny even back then. They definitely don't hold up now. The, the malapportionment of the Senate where states are so different in their populations has just become a greater problem over time and it gets baked into the Electoral College. So I think there, there are plenty of reasons to look at other alternatives. Yeah, and one, just throw one last thing in there too. My, my, my favorite uh, sort of nightmare scenario with the Electoral College that we haven't had to confront in some time, that is when there is no electoral college majority winner or if there's a tie. And there were a lot of scenarios in this election that were producing a 269-269 tie. If that were to happen, the House of Representatives uh, elects the president then. And talk about unequal representation. Then you have the littlest states like North and South Dakota, Wyoming, having the same power to elect our president as the biggest states of California and Texas and Florida uh, in New York. And so that, you know, leads to a mal, uh, mal representation of like a, you know, 55 to one ratio. And it's just really, you know, way out of whack. So just one final comment on that. There, there is a statute called the Electoral Count Act, which is from the 1880s, which came into play in Florida in 2000, that is designed to, to forestall a failure of the Electoral College or a dispute in uh, the, the vote in a state. And uh, uh, as Ned Foley, who's a professor of law at Ohio State and probably one of the most uh, respected election law scholars in the country, the problem with the, electoral call, with the Electoral Count Act is no one really has any idea what it means. The language is impenetrable. It doesn't provide real guidance as to what, uh, what, what should happen or what would happen. So in a sense, we're kind of on a knife edge where we could wind up with enough disputed elections and sometime in the future or a tie. And that may provide the, the impetus to, to substitute some other system. But uh, uh, absent that, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be around for a while. We have some more great audience questions here. I'll try to move quickly through them. Should there be uniform voting laws across all states for federal elections and how would that happen from Gen SIP? Well, I, the short answer is I think we will never have perfectly uniform election laws. The history of the United States really grants a lot of independence to states to do what they want. The US Constitution says explicitly that states have the right to de decide the time, place, and manner that they'll hold federal elections. Uh, but the federal government has slowly become more involved over time, doing some simple things like setting a common election day in the 1800s. Before that, elections were held at different times across the states, even in choosing members of Congress or presidential electors. Things like the Voting Rights Act, which granted protections to 
racial and ethnic minorities and language minorities was part of, uh, you know, kind of a federal encroachment providing some, some uniformity. After the 2000 election meltdown, the Congress and president passed the Help America Vote Act, which created voter registration databases and provisional ballots and a lot of other things that are part of the structure today. So we have been in a, in a very long march towards greater uniformity, but there's still a long distance ahead of us, I think, if that's the a place where we end up. Yeah, I, th I think Barry is, is, is right that a lot of the differences between states, uh, registration methods, uh, the availability of absentee ballots, uh, that, that those are things that uh, I think would uh, uh, have a tough time withstanding Supreme Court scrutiny as, as uh, violating some of these explicit uh, provisions in the, in the Constitution. Um, so, which is also one of the issues of going to a national popular vote, that if you have non-uniform standards across the state, that just is another way of, uh, of, of differential weighting that replaces the, uh, the inequities of the Electoral College with a different kind of inequity. So Danielle Camps wonders why the record turnout in Dane County versus flat turnout in Milwaukee County. Any thoughts on that? Well, one thing I think that we saw nationally, and this wasn't true just in Wisconsin, but I think Barry alluded to this in his introductory comments that uh, urban turnout in general tended to be fairly flat. Uh, it was a little higher in, in some cities, but what happened in Milwaukee was not unusual for uh, quite a few cities. And the, the, the non-white vote was not as high as a percentage of the electorate um, as we've seen in some elections, certainly 2008, 2012, uh, black vote uh, turnout was quite a bit higher than we saw in this election. So some of it had to, to do with the, the turnout of, of non-white voters. Um, and obviously there's a higher non-white percent population in Milwaukee than, than Dane County, but we saw that replicated in, in other uh, bigger cities and medium-sized cities around the country as well. I, I'd add two things to that. One is a socioeconomic status difference between Dane County and Milwaukee County. They're both democratic, but for different reasons. Turnout was up in Dane County where you have people with higher levels of education, higher incomes, but also in Waukesha County and Ozaki County, some of the Milwaukee suburbs turnout hit these astronomical levels of 85 or 90 percent in some places. Milwaukee just doesn't have the same resources in the population. And then I think that was exacerbated potentially by the absence of the Democratic ground game. You know, the Democratic campaign, the Biden campaign, decided not to do face-to-face -face campaigning, didn't do rallies, all the traditional groundwork The Democrats rely so much on just wasn't happening. And I think Dane County can get by with that. <laughs> Uh, there are other ways to mobilize people in a kind of high SES community, but in a more resource poor community, I, th I think that face to face canvassing really does have an effect. And it may have hurt, that may be one of the things that really hurt the Biden campaign in places like Philadelphia, Detroit, Milwaukee. Interesting. Uh, let's take one more audience question from Mark Ryan. Um, what is a possible solution that would help create? an environment with greater compromise between the two parties. Uh, Mark notes that uh, perhaps gerrymandering or maybe the rise of identity uh, as a political force is creating these deeper and deeper divides between red and blue. Any thoughts on what we could change that would uh, help promote more compromise? Well, that's that's the $64 billion question, isn't it? Um, there's. Uh, the, the question of whether gerrymandering has been a contributor to polarization is disputed. Uh, you, you do see, I think, some evidence uh, at some levels, but the, you can't gerrymander the Senate because those boundaries are fixed and the, the, the Senate is as polarized as the Wisconsin legislature um, is. Uh, at the same time, one of the things that gerrymandering does is it insulates uh, partisan majorities that that are gerrymandered into majorities from accountability. So even large shifts in uh, voter behavior or voter preferences don't result in in changes. I, I think the issues of polarization actually go much deeper than uh, gerrymandering. Uh, the 
that gerrymandering that we saw in 2010, which was historically quite extreme, I think is more of a symptom of that polarization than an underlying cause. So I, I don't know what the what the answer to this question is of how to encourage the parties people to compromise because right now, especially for Republicans, this this strategy of not compromising has actually been quite successful. One interesting reform that's now moving across the states slowly is ranked choice voting. The state of Alaska just this week passed it to use in their elections. Maine used it for the first time in a presidential election this year. And there is a view that by having voters rank all the candidates rather than just picking one, it forces the parties and the candidates to cooperate on the campaign trail because there's always the possibility that the person who votes against you at the top of the ticket might rank you second and you might get those votes. And so there are cases like in San Francisco, they use ranked choice voting to choose the mayor. And in the last mayor's race, I think the top two candidates actually each endorsed each other, <laughs> asking that each of them place their supporters second. And so you get people playing nice and maybe other parties showing up besides the Democrats and Republicans. So it might kind of soften the knife edge you know, battles that are now going on between the parties in this closely divided era. Interesting. Uh, final question, you know, you mentioned the word polarization and we certainly feel the polarization creeping into views on higher education. We see it in a lot of surveys, a Pew survey that came out recently. Um, you know, and we all know it's widely believed that academia would skew left of center politically and I'm not just talking about students, but even faculty. Um, you know, what, what would you say to people, uh, prospective parent, uh, you know, concerned about bias coloring thinking and conclusions of faculty members? Um, you know, and especially I'm, I'm real cognizant of that because we're talking about politics tonight. Right. How do you all address that, David? Well, one, one thing I always tell my students on the first day of class is that I, my goal as a teacher is always to give them the tools and skills they need to learn how to think about politics. I never want to tell them what to think. And so I, I really try to keep partisan politics out of it, you know, present both sides, both perspectives on, on different issues. And, and my goal is by the end of the semester, they won't know if I'm a Democrat or Republican. And I always you know, do that as well in any kind of you know, public speaking, media appearances, you know, where I think our job as social scientists is to try to provide the objective evidence necessary to be able to make informed choices. And that's, that's what we, we try to do is to, you know, to analyze the data and figure out why things are happening. And that's, I think, an important part of, of the broader Wisconsin idea, the role of the university too, to, to play that role in educating the broader public. And so I think you know, all of us are committed to that, that way of thinking about the relationship between political science as a science and informing these political debates. So I, I'll, I'll second what, what David said, that, that this is something that we talk about amongst ourselves and in the, in the broader discipline that I, I think very strongly that, that I, that we have an ethical obligation to uh, be both neutral from a partisan perspective, but also to tell students the truth. Uh, and uh, when I do the large undergraduate classes, when we were in person, I always did a survey at the very end of the class where I, I ask, among other things, whether the students, what do you think I am? Do you think I'm a Republican, a Democrat, a Green, a Libertarian? And for, for 30 years, the responses have been basically 40% say they think I'm a Democrat, it is Madison. Uh, about 25% say they think I'm a Republican, 5% say Libertarian, and the rest have no idea. And that strikes me as, a, as about right. Um, so th th this, is, this is something that, that I know that all of us in the political science department take, take very seriously, that we have a, an obligation to, to students to not indoctrinate. So when you say that's about right, what are you today? No, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> are you 40, the 40% 40 or the 25 <laughs> going in there, I, I have testified repeatedly under oath in federal court that I am not a Democrat. So that always comes up. So <laughs> I think Ken is a Sagittarius. 
<laughs> I have a Capricorn, but close enough. I, I was also just say this session we've just spent together over the last hour is pretty representative of what would happen in one of our classes. I don't think there was any hint of partisanship here. We're trying to understand what happened. We are curious people. We want our students to be curious and understand the world. And having a bias or pushing in one direction just doesn't serve that goal very well. It's not sifting and winnowing. And so we, we really prize that objective look for the truth. So I just, just one last thing, Michael. I have two autographed baseballs on my bookshelf. One of them is from Harmon Killebrew. Uh, the other is George Will. So. All right. <laughs> well, two great players, different games though. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I thank you. You know, I, I also think it's it's certainly true, you know, in academia, you certainly get rewarded for being the person sometimes who has a different but correct point of view. You know, we we go into our professions often to question conventional wisdom, and that sometimes can make, I guess, the status quo feel a little uneasy with people like us. Uh, but it is sort of our job to question that, and uh, that's what we usually do uh, some of our research on. So. Uh, well, thank you all for taking time to be with us tonight. This was a very informative session. I know I learned a lot and, um, you know, I, I wish I could see you on the nightly news more often. Um, we need a little bit more of that fact-based uh, commentary, I think. So thank you all. Thanks, Mike. So the UW Now will be back on Tuesday, December 1. We're taking next week off. I'm going to spend next Tuesday by myself getting myself psyched up for Thanksgiving, uh, which I think I'm supposed to spend by myself as well. Uh, until then, I hope you have the opportunity to catch our Badger Huddle armchair pregames. Uh, the football season is back on for now. Let's hope we can keep playing because our team sure looks good this year. Um, and, and these armchair pregames are your answer to the tailgating shortage this season. Um, so, Thanks for joining us tonight. I hope you enjoyed our program on Wisconsin. <laughs>